allowing the air to clean the body from the inside. Allowing the air to open the channels in the body and to refresh the body. Okay, and let's place the hands on our back. We're going to continue breathing. So we want to send the air to the back of the body and bring awareness to the back side of the body. So we inhale through the nose. Try to expand the back inside your hands. Few more times. Okay, and we're going to release and just take a yes with our head. So we're lifting and lowering the head, saying yes with the head. We're going to take the ear towards the shoulder, so one side and the other. Move it from side to side. And we're going to take the hands on our shoulders and we're just going to lift one hand and the other hand high up towards the ceiling. Look forward. And we're going to take both hands up. So both hands is going up together, lifting and lowering, keeping a long back, continue breathing. Okay, and let's keep the hands up. We're just going to exhale and take them forward all the way down and then lift them up. Inhale. And again, lowering the hands, exhaling, and then inhaling, lifting up. Two more times. Exhale. And inhale. And last time. Okay, we're going to place the hands on our shoulders. We're going to roll. Shoulders just warming up. The upper body circling to one side and then to the other side. Okay. And we're just gonna release the hands and uh, thank and you. We, we have to slowly also flow now back into the uh, further uh, next part of the schedule. Uh, that was very relieving. Thank you very much, Michal. Sure. I'm also teaching at the Yoga Hub. I will send you the link to the website and you're all uh, invited to enjoy online classes uh, from the Yoga Hub. Thank you very much, Michal. Um, and as we will be slowly moving on to the perfect, thank you, Hagai. <laughs> so a short introduction about us. How did you end up here? You probably clicked on the link on meetup.com. This is uh, our website where we host all our events. And by we, I mean women tech makers. We are an organization uh, that is running in Berlin for the seventh year now. Our aim is to have the Berlin tech scene to be more diverse and it means many different things and that means we have many different events. Anywhere from code workshops to talks about how to write your CV to talks like what to do with your money. And we are a team of 10 volunteers. We are always happy to receive requests for more types of events. This event and practically the entire financial series that we had so far it came to be because this was the request of our community as things have changed the last year throughout the pandemic. And if you have ideas for talks that you would either want to hear or would want to give, please 
write me on Slack or write me here in the Zoom chat. And we're always happy to have more interesting types of events. And um, before we will start the talk, I want to ask our presenter, Hagai, what is your preferred way of uh, asking questions? Would you like people to just write them here during the conversation? Would you like people to just interrupt you and speak the questions? Um, would you like that the people who type their questions then towards the end, I'll be reading out that for you? Or should each person read out uh, by the order of writing that? What's working best for you? Yeah, hi. Um, definitely interrupt um, whenever you want, as much as you want. Um, it's anyway a little bit uh, difficult to sort of stay in touch with everybody via Zoom. So definitely feel free to unmute and jump in whenever you want and you have a questions. And then towards the end, if those questions in the chat, uh, Natalia would probably need your help. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also uh, uh, freestyle that as long as everybody stays civil and um, yeah, let's the other one yeah, finish the sentence, then yeah, sure. All right, then uh, the permissions of this call will be set in a way that everybody has their uh, option to unmute. This will not be hidden for the attendees unless anything chaotic happens. And uh, yeah, if you want to ask something, feel free to ask a guy right away by just unmuting yourself. If you want to ask something anonymously, you can always write that as a private message to me and I will ask that at the end. If you're asking something specific to a specific slide, maybe just write down what's the reference so that this will be uh, easily relatable. And one last thing, this is going to be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube. If you want to see our YouTube link, this is in the event. But this also means that your name, as you display it here, uh, will be visible on our uh, channel. So in case you want to use a first name or a pseudonym or anything, now is the time to change, as I will be introducing Fagai. Und Zwal. Guy is the co-owner of a boutique real estate investment firm, and he is an independent real estate consultant. He has been here in Berlin since 2015, and even though he joined uh, the city to be a techie with an ad tech startup, he uh, practically right away started doing real estate things. And he thinks that this is something that should be in anyone's investment portfolio. It uh, goes without saying, Hagai, I think everybody should have an investment portfolio. And... Uh, we hope that by the end of this talk, you will be convinced to have one and you'll have some good questions. So, Hagai, the stage is all yours. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks for the intro and uh, hi, everybody, and thank you for joining. Um, thank you, Natalie, for the background. So it's really more than enough about myself and we can uh, jump straight in. Um, maybe as a tiny bit of background, um, how did I get here and how did we, um, together with Natalie, got to have this uh, talk? Um, I, was, I was watching another uh, real estate webinar a while ago, um, which I think was supposed to um, clarify a little bit or make it a little bit more accessible. And at least personally, I got a feeling that it, it somehow made it feel even more complicated than what it is. Um, and I think that's maybe a really big uh, entry barrier with, with real estate. Um, from the outside, it sometimes seems like um, either like a jungle, which it's, it is a little bit, uh, but you can definitely find your way through it. Um, it seems a little bit more complicated. It's, I guess it's when considering alternatives, it's just easier to sit at home and maybe um, buy stocks or, or ETFs or anything like that. Um, and really what I wanted to do is to, to simplify uh, as much as possible and demystify, if you will. Um, and I was thinking a lot about how to do it. I was having a lot of back and forth with myself. Um, and there's really a lot that, that can be said and we only have one hour, so it's really hard to cover everything. But eventually what, what I ended up with was um, after a, a sort of an intro that is more high level about the, the financials of a real estate transaction in general, um, either as an investment or, or for your own use. Um, I would simply go through the steps of buying real estate. I will naturally go through the steps of buying real estate uh, in Germany and specifically in Berlin because A, it's what I know best. 
and B, it's what I guess is most relevant for most people here in the audience. If, of course, you have a, a specific question, as I said, feel free to jump in. If it's a very personal question, we can just take it offline later. Um, let's get started. Um, going very quickly over what we will cover today, um, and this is a rough estimate of how it's going to be um, uh, played out. As I mentioned, a, a little bit of background regarding real estate. Um, it's hard to cover it all in 10 minutes, but I will try to give you just a teaser or an, a high level view of why I think it's a good investment for almost everybody. Um, and, and what it can do to your portfolio. Um, we'll then go into the financials of real estate. Um, it's a little bit different than, again, compared to just trading stocks or, or any, anything like that. And we, we will dedicate most of the time to the buying process. We'll simply go step by step. Um, I will mention that also further on, but it's a little bit of a, of a, a guidebook um, or maybe even a checklist to each step of the way. Um, I guess it might be a lot to take in within the, the time that we have today. So uh, feel free to um, you know, uh, screenshot, uh, take down notes, or simply go back to the recording later. Um, and, and in real time today, as I mentioned, uh, feel free to jump in with a question if anything is unclear to you. Uh, I tried not to, not to assume any prior knowledge, but um, I might have missed anything, so just interrupt me whenever you want. Moving on. <clears throat> I think what I like about real estate the most, or one of the things that I like the most, is that at the end of the day, it's a very, very simple business. And what I mean by that is that um, we probably don't really understand, um, not at 100% at least, the business model or the technology or the, the mechanics of uh, any um, company that we have invested in, um, or not even the mechanics of the, of the stock market, uh, if we're just investing in, in uh, funds or ETFs or whatever. Real estate at the end of the day is really, really, really simple. Um, we all need somewhere to stay, we all need somewhere to live. Um, we have been consumers of real estate probably for most of our lives. Um, either, either as owners or uh, probably more likely as tenants. We have rented apartments, we've sublet apartments, we've lived in different places and therefore actually we're all quite experienced in this business. Um, it's pretty simple and pretty intuitive to walk into an apartment and have that sort of gut feeling if it's a good apartment or not. If it should be more expensive or a little bit cheaper compared to the average in the market wherever you live. And Therefore, I think that in terms of understanding what we're renting or buying, actually, we all have a good starting point and we're all quite experienced. We just need to sort of flick that switch in our mind and, and consider ourselves to be at least a little bit of experts in that sense. In terms of the financials of real estate and why I think it's a good investment pretty much for everybody, um, one thing that I like about it a lot is it's a long-term investment that you are uh, forcing yourself to commit to. And I'm not going to say that there's no way out, but it's a long-term commitment. And that's probably a good thing because we're all, you know, we're all people, we all tend to commit, but then maybe not to stick to it. Um, you might decide to save up a certain amount monthly, but um, there's no real, um, external commitment that's really forcing you to stick to that. So you might, you know, you might cheat a little bit here and there. Uh, if you are making a real estate transaction and you're financing that with a mortgage, you will pay this mortgage. Um, and that's a very good thing. It's really uh, making a promise to yourself that you probably cannot really break for the next five, 10, maybe 20 years. Speaking of a mortgage, um, I'm not sure, and, and uh, it's hard to, to, again, via Zoom, it's hard to really get a feeling for it, but I'm not sure what everybody's sentiment toward mortgage is. Um, especially here in Germany, at least the Germans, and, and if I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing here, uh, some of them consider this to be debt, and debt is normally a bad thing, or at least considered to be. Um, 
And what is, I think, really important to, to understand and, and sort of, you know, change, wrap your head around it and change your mind if you need to, um, it is that it's a loan that you have to repay, but it's a very different type of loan. Um, from a financial point of view, mortgage for buying real estate is probably the most reasonable form of leverage, financial leverage that is out there. Um, if you consider leveraging yourself financially for trading stocks, you're already at a very, very high risk area. It's something very risky, very adventurous. Um, that's not the case with financing a real estate deal with mortgage. At the end, there's one, um, uh, one big security that's, that's securing the deal and that's the asset itself, the apartment. Uh, I'm not uh, hoping for anyone or for myself to reach that point where the bank has to use this security, but it means that you as an individual are much more protected and better protected than in any sort of other, other sort of financial leverage. It's worth mentioning that if there was ever a time in terms of financing the deal, if there was ever a time to do that, it's probably now. Um, interest rates are historically low. Um, actually, there hasn't been such a period of low interest uh, ever in the history. Um, it's probably a different topic and, and it has many other consequences, but in terms of financing your um, near future real estate deals, um, it's a very, very attractive sort of financing. In assuming that we're uh, or that you're not yet real estate investors or even homeowners, um, I want to try to give you a little bit of a more tangible, a little bit more of a realistic feeling what it means, this concept of financing your real estate deal with, with mortgage. And we're not going to go deep into the, the numbers or the mechanics of it or how it works. Um, I would just like you to look at a very simplified example. Um, of what it might mean. If we're looking, we're starting here at year one of the deal, um, the darker shade of gray, of um, red, sorry, is the value of the apartment or the property that you bought. So in day, on day one, it's actually the, the price that you paid. And we're assuming that the price of the asset keeps on going up. The lighter shade of red is the amount of loan that you still need to repay. So again, in, in day one, that's the amount of financing you took out from the bank. And you actually, as you can understand, the difference between the two is your own capital, the money that you had to pay out of pocket in order to complete the deal. And in this example, um, what you can see is that the value of your property keeps on going up quite steadily um, over the course of the first 10 years of, of the transaction. Whereas the amount of the loan that is still outstanding that you still need to pay out is constantly decreasing because you're making payments to cover that loan. That's your, your monthly uh, mortgage payments. Um, I wanna um, just explain, this is not a hypothetical example. It's a very, very realistic one. Um, I, I basically simplified it, but I took it out from uh, one apartment that I own personally, privately. Um, and I would even add to that, that here, when I mention a 5% uh, increase in value annually, it's a very, very, very conservative one, specifically when we're talking about the last few years in Berlin. And to, to again, simplify and wrap it all up, what you need to have in terms of capital on day one is the difference here, this small bit here. And from there on, Hopefully it's almost on autopilot. You get rent or you pay uh, yourself the, the monthly mortgage payments. You slowly uh, decrease the amount that is still outstanding that you owe to the bank. The value of the property increases. And then from having this bit, by the end of the 10 year period, you have this. And what's nice about it is that the only amount of capital that you need to get in the game to, to get this deal started is this one. By the end of this period, you have much, much, much more. And from there on, of course, you have many different uh, options. And of course, you can keep it and enjoy the cash flow. You can uh, sell the property and cash out. And that's, that's probably a different discussion. But what I wanted to show here is that um, 
if done right, and if you're not exceeding the amount of, of a reasonable risk that you are willing to take on, um, this is what I think would be really the, the, the beauty of leveraging yourself with the mortgage and ending up here while only having a small amount of capital available here on day one. Another thing that um, I think is important to understand and another thing that I like a lot about real estate, um, basically what you're getting is two types of, uh, of return on your investment. The first one is the ongoing cash flow you're getting from a uh, rent, assuming you're renting out a property that you bought. Um, and the second one, as I mentioned, is the appreciation over time. It's how the value of your property increases. Um, the, the, the nice thing about this combination is, as I mentioned, one of them is, is ongoing. Uh, and again, if there's an increase in, in the rents uh, where you're renting out your apartment, then your cash flow will also improve and it might increase to a point where it's not only covering your mortgage payments, it's actually bringing in net cash flow um, on a monthly basis. Depreciation is on paper, it's not money in the bank, um, but it's something that, you know, I, I guess even if you're not yet a property owner, it's easy for you to imagine and to understand that it does give you a lot of financial security. It puts you in a very different place when you know, looking ahead into your future when looking at your entire portfolio and so on. And lastly, um, what I think is a very good point uh, when, when looking at the real estate from a financial point of view, it's relatively stable. It's not that it cannot go down uh, or that it cannot at least stagnate. And that's also not good for, um, for an investment, but it is typically and generally speaking, much more stable than other forms of investment, other investment instruments, uh, such as, for example, as I mentioned, stocks, ETFs, anything like that. And so it really helps to balance out your, your portfolio uh, and diversify and gives you a little bit of a, of a stability. Based on all of these and, and what I just told you about it, um, I think I like to look at real estate compared to other forms of investment uh, and look at it um, within this perspective of the different uh, attributes of it as an investment. Um, in terms of the risk that it has, the yield that it potentially brings, how liquid you are while uh, or during the period of investment, uh, what sort of diversification uh, it offers you, uh, the capital requirements in order to start and if it offers any form of leverage or not. And if we're quickly going over this um, top to bottom and left to right, it, probably the most popular form of investment um, is stocks and ETFs, uh, anything in the stock market. I didn't go into to the more um, exotic forms of investments in, in options and leverage trades, but just the normal basic uh, stocks and ETFs. Um, in terms of risk, at the end of the day, it is risky. Um, as, I, as I said, it can go down uh, and when it does, it can go down by a lot. At the same time, it offers um, pretty high yields um, and in that sense, it's very attractive. You are very liquid when, when trading stocks. You can sell out at any moment uh, and, and use the money for whatever you need. And in terms of diversification, it's really hard to compete. Um, you can pretty much be fully diversified when uh, trading stack stocks and ETFs. You can buy any stock pretty much in the world. Um, and that, of course, helps to reduce the risk. In terms of capital requirements, of course, it's not zero because you need some amount of cash to start with, but there's no entry barrier. There's no minimum. You can start with pretty much any amount. And lastly, when it comes to leverage, um, I'm not a fan. Let's put it like that. And the uh, potential risk is amazingly high and uh, I wouldn't go there. Um, bonds, maybe the most boring out of those three alternatives, not very uh, exotic or attractive, but pretty steady. Um, it has some risk, but it's not that risky. The yield, of course, is not comparable to uh, stocks and ETFs. But again, you are also very liquid. You can easily diversify. Very easy to start with any amount. Um, leverage is maybe not that relevant. The, the 
margins are simply not, not large enough to uh, allow for financing and then using the money for trading bonds, except for specific cases. Uh, so let's leave it aside for a second. And then when comparing real estate to that, um, the risk is, I believe, in general, and, and of course it depends on what you buy, but generally speaking, is slightly lower or significantly even lower in the long term, um, simply because um, the timing of, of um, when you go into the market in terms of, of stocks and ETFs can be critical. If you're investing for the long term, it doesn't matter, but if you're investing for the medium term, this might make a big difference. Not so much with real estate, unless you were extremely unlucky and bought a house in the US in 2008, but except for very extreme examples, it's not that risky. Um, the yield, however, and that's the interesting part, it can compete and sometimes even win this competition in terms of yield against stocks and ETFs. Probably in most cases, if it is comparable, it's thanks to leveraging with uh, a mortgage. Um, again, depends on, on specific cases, but generally speaking, as an, an individual who's looking into a simple real estate transaction, without financing, it's probably not very interesting in terms of yield. Um, oh, sorry. Um, a real estate uh, transaction without financing is probably not very attractive when it comes to yield. Um, once we leverage that with financing, we're at a completely different territory and the, the yields that we're looking at are very, very attractive and can definitely compete with stocks, ETFs and the likes. The biggest downsides of real estate as a, as a financial investment you're not very liquid. During the period of investment, it's very hard to pull out. Um, depending on, on the timing and how urgently you need the money, you might end up cashing out at a loss if you have to do it at a very poor timing. That's something to consider and it, it is a medium to long-term investment almost by definition. Definitely when we're speaking about the German market. In terms of diversification, again, it's, a, it's definitely a downside. Um, it's going to be very hard for you to buy 50 different apartments in 50 different cities uh, for almost everybody. Um, again, when comparing that to, to the stock market, it's, uh, you can diversify as much as you want. And the last entry barrier, there's no way around it. You need a certain amount of, of free cash to even get started. You cannot get started with just 100 euros. Uh, well, you can do that with stocks. You need a certain amount of available cash, of available capital. Um, and, and yeah, unfortunately that's something that, it, it's just the way it is. As I mentioned in the beginning, um, there's a certain, uh, um, I think a general feeling that somehow real estate investment or real estate transactions are more complicated to execute than any other forms of trade. And um, there is a certain truth to it. Um, you, you cannot just do it from, you know, from your living room, just with your laptop. Um, there's much more to it. Um, however, and it's something that I would like you to sort of keep in mind from here and, and you know, until we get to the end of the, of the talk, Consider the people around you that do own real estate. Um, I don't think that they are necessarily um, that much smarter or brighter or more experienced than you are. They might have simply gone through it once uh, and now they are much more calm about it and they don't think that it's that terrifying. Um, but a lot of the people around you, private people, individuals that own real estate privately or as an investment, um, they are just people like you. It's not that complicated. It's not that hard. Um, and another point that is worth mentioning is that, as I said, it's a long-term investment. It's a pretty big investment, uh, probably the, the biggest one that you have made so far. Uh, it makes sense to get help to push you, you know, across the finish line um, for certain aspects of the deal, for the whole deal, whatever. Um, 
it's big enough and it's long-term enough for you to consider it and just to help you with your first transaction. Um, you might realize that it's actually not that bad and you might move on to your second one where you can already pretty much be independent and do everything on your own and, and sort of keep on gaining that experience. So what I will try to do, uh, as I mentioned before, is to really simplify and uh, demystify. Uh, basically, I hope to give you the feeling that it's not that bad and to sort of provide you with a guidebook where you can say, okay, I know in which step I am right now. I know what is the next step. I know what I have to prepare and what to uh, take notice of. And there's sort of a clear path from the starting point and all the way to the finish line. We're generally looking at two use cases, uh, if, I, if I really simplify it. We're either buying as an investment or for our own use. If it is the investment case, probably what I care about the most is the potential yield of this deal. How do I um, estimate and predict the, the developments in price in, in both rent and price uh, of the property? Um, what's the upside there? I would look probably a little bit more into taxes uh, and, uh, and also, like I said, into financing. I would care a lot about getting a positive cash flow. I wouldn't want to go into a deal where I constantly have to put in more money into the investment, where, to put it simply, the rent doesn't cover the mortgage. Um, and generally speaking, it's a, it's a much more rational decision. It's, it's coming more from the head. When I'm buying for my own use, and again, I'm, I'm generalizing here, but, but it is the way it is with, with most people, at least in most cases, um, it's not that rational anymore. Uh, I would probably care much more about the location because I'm going to leave them. I would consider my personal needs and my preferences and more likely than not, I would plan ahead uh, mainly, uh, or the most common one is really uh, family plans and I would probably buy an apartment that is slightly bigger than what I really need right now because I'm thinking ahead and I'm, I don't want to buy another one in two years or in five years. Um, if in the investment case I was looking at um, securing a, a positive cash flow, here it's normally more of a, can I handle it? Can I really make those monthly payments? Um, it's, it's a slightly different state of mind, I think. And at the end, it's, it's all coming from me being much more emotionally invested in that. It's not so much a pure uh, rational decision if it's a good investment or not. It's, it's a little bit more emotional. It's a little bit more of, is this my dream apartment or not? And the result would be that I'm much more likely in the own use uh, case to stretch my budget a little bit, to plan with a certain budget and then end up buying something a little bit bigger or more expensive. Um, and I, I, I need to consider that if I do that, it might change the balance of, of my overall portfolio. Uh, again, to give a simple example, it might be that I do have a nice balanced portfolio, but I would take a lot of money out of uh, stocks and ETFs and maybe a, a saving fund that I have in order to put down the initial capital and to make the transaction happen. Now, um, it's important to say right now, also for, from here and to the rest of the presentation, um, Personally and purely personally, I, I definitely prefer the investment scenario um, because of everything I just said, because it helps me stay a little bit more rational, cold, if you like. Um, it's a little bit less gut feeling and a little bit more Excel sheets. However, uh, it is uh, very, very common for people to plan on buying real estate for their own use. I'm, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, absolutely not. What I am saying is, Consider that even if you're buying for your own use, it's probably the biggest transaction that you have made so far. And it's gonna stay one of the biggest uh, that you will ever do. Um, just think of it like that. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it or it doesn't mean that it's a bad thing, absolutely not. If you just try to think of it as a, a long, maybe fulfilling a dream of owning an apartment, uh, of having your own home and so on. Alongside that, it's also a financial transaction, a very big one, and therefore just do it accordingly. Even if it's a dream, even if it's, uh, there's a lot of emotions involved, at the same time, even if it's for your own use, have an Excel sheet, do the calculation, 
see where it puts you uh, in terms of your monthly mortgage payments, the price that you're uh, paying, and so on. Um, and it will just help you stay balanced and not you know, overstretch yourself into a place where you live in your uh, dream apartment, but you're just stressed on a monthly basis because the payments are really more than you hoped for, or more than you planned for. Okay, um, as I mentioned before, I'm just gonna walk you through the steps. Um, I wanna start by saying that it is sort of an overview. Um, it's really hard within the time that we have today to cover each and every steps. But this is an overview of definitely the most important ones. It's from start to finish, so, so it covers the whole process. Um, and again, like I mentioned before, um, just try to take in as much as you can. Uh, if you considered making an investment, if you started, if you're in the process or if you completed one, uh, and something here you know, makes you think of a question or a comment, then feel free to jump in. Uh, for those of you who wanted to but weren't sure how, this hopefully gives you something to follow and, and really serves as a basis for, for you getting into that. Um, and, and same here. If, if something is completely unclear, definitely jump in, don't be shy. Um, the first step, as I see it, is actually before you search for an apartment, is first of all checking your finances and checking your ability to get financing. Um, I've mentioned before, and I, I tried to demonstrate that, how big of a part financing plays. Uh, it can really make or break a deal in terms of how attractive it is financially. If it's for your own use, it's simply whether or not you can afford the apartment you would like to have. And therefore, it's normally where you should start. Now, if some of you are um, surprised or confused by that because it's counterintuitive, what can I do with financing if I don't even know what I want to buy? Um, that's fine, I understand that. You are able to get an indication from whatever financial institute about the amount of financing you could get. Um, of course, at the end of the day, it will depend on the specific asset you're planning to, planning to buy, but the basic information on who you are, your employment, um, your financials, and so on, is already there. And you can and you should start those checks before you start searching for an apartment because as I mentioned, if you don't know that, you're simply missing a huge piece of the puzzle and it's gonna be very hard for you to decide what is relevant for you and what is not. In terms of where to start and what to do, um, I wanna say something that is very true in general, I think for the whole process itself. Um, don't be shy and don't be too polite. Uh, it's gonna be very hard for you to, to get a deal or to get a good deal if you are too shy and polite. Um, and what I mean by that is that some people uh, would say, I don't want to bother anyone or I don't want to waste anyone's time with a meeting about financing that I'm not going to take. And that's fine, but that's the reality of, of the business and that's, uh, that's absolutely okay. Uh, it's part of the game and it's, it's not something unfair or uh, impolite to do. Um, you should, in the first step of the way, when looking into your financing, you should definitely try out different alternatives um, and you should try to see where you stand and go for the best one. Where to go and what to, what to ask. Um, personally, I think that you should always, almost by default, uh, include your own bank in the alternative that you're looking into, simply because they know you. Um, you have your account there, maybe also other savings or, or uh, stocks or whatever and it's relatively easy to start, um, it will just give you a, a basic indication of where you stand. At the same time, more often than not, uh, it's not necessarily the best alternative. And therefore, uh, I would start with them to, to get experience, to go through this meeting, to hear from them what documents or what information they want to have about you. Um, and I would just use that as, as training. Now, if they have a good offer for you, go for it. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, but even if they don't, it's fine. And you know, it's, it's just, it helps to get started. Uh, your second option is mortgage brokers, uh, companies or individuals that that's what they do. Um, 
to, to quickly clarify, uh, they would get commissions from the bank or the financial institute, they would give you the loan. You don't pay them anything. Um, so first of all, keep that in mind. You shouldn't, it's not supposed to cost you anything. Uh, if it does, then probably it's a, it's a sign for you to walk away. Um, but to the point, the idea is to have one meeting with one such mortgage broker and then from that person to get various alternatives in various banks, financial institutes, and so on. So you would have to provide the information, they would do the legwork for you and they would get back to you with hopefully more than just one or two offers. They would give you a very good indication of where you currently stand. Uh, the ones that are uh, good at what they do uh, would also provide a little bit of insight. How did the bank calculate your uh, credit worthiness? Um, how did the bank evaluate your ability to pay back the mortgage? Um, what's behind the numbers and it will help you understand and also to adjust. Um, lastly, those online platforms that um, provide the exact same thing. It's just, you, you basically type in a little bit of basic information. Supposedly they run a check based on, on those details, but it also, it just leads to, to a more thorough uh, process that, that involves also face-to-face -face, uh, meetings. Um, it's a very easy and comfortable option. Um, and if we consider that in the first step, what you really want to do is just sort of gain experience and, and gain some, uh, some uh, track record, just do it. Fill in the details. Uh, you might get a little bit of, you know, uh, um, marketing emails and, and newsletters. It's, it's a small price to pay. Go through the process, see what information is required, see what they ask you and see what results you get. It will be a very good place to, again, to start and start building up this, putting together this picture of how much financing can I actually get. Um, of course, in order to complete that, what you do need to know before, how much money you actually have. Um, it's a very individual question. Uh, it depends, of course, on your financials and how much you're willing to put down into a deal that is mid to long term, at least. Um, my recommendation to you is whatever amount you decide on, stick to it as much as you can. Uh, it might be uh, easier said than done throughout the deal, but really try to stick to it. Don't end up putting all of your liquidity into this deal. It might be a great deal, but you don't want to stay completely illiquid. Um, I think it's first of all a mental thing. It's just not a good feeling. It's the, all the what if scenario and what if I need some money immediately. Um, but also financially, it's, it's unbalancing a little bit and it's not a good place to be. In, um, in terms of the documents that you are likely uh, gonna need, um, your salaries or if you're self-employed or company owners or whatever, any sort of, of proof of uh, income, your annual tax statements, uh, it's pretty much a must. Uh, personal information, your visa, your passport, your, um, what, what, what's your status here in Germany if you're not from here. Um, and of course, any other information about your investments in other things, your savings, what, what amount of capital you have. Once you figure out what's your uh, status in terms of financing and what you can expect, now's the time to set a budget. Uh, it's basically made out of those two elements, your own capital and the financing you can expect to get. Always leave a safety margin um, because you never know what, what, what's gonna happen. Um, and then decide on a budget and this is the number you're gonna go with. Uh, and again, same here, as much as you can, try to stick to this number. The next thing, once you have a budget, is to see what actually fits into this budget. Um, and where you're going to search, um, what is it that you're looking for? Um, basically, it's made up of where, or what, how big, how much, and so on. Um, personally, I recommend to really try to narrow it down. Um, if it is for your own use, you probably already know where you want to live and maybe where you don't want to live. So at least in that sense, maybe here, buying for your own use is actually easier. If it's for investment, it really depends on um, your budget and what could actually fit into this budget. It might be that you cannot afford buying an apartment in a, a inside the ring, let's say, in the, the more expensive uh, neighborhoods. Um, you might not be looking into Mitte, but into Schöneberg. 
And that's absolutely okay. I strongly recommend to narrow it down um, to something like three or four neighborhoods if we're looking at, at Berlin as an example. Uh, more than that, it starts getting confusing. Uh, and at the end of the day, remember that it's not just theoretical. It's not, not just looking at, uh, at the map. You will have to go there. You will have to know those areas. You have to get a feeling of what is a good street and what is not such a great street and so on. So you really need to focus in order not to just spread yourself too thin. Um, you, if you're looking for an investment, um, there's maybe a basic decision to make if you want to go for one of the more mature and slightly more expensive areas, or you want to maybe go to what is now up and coming. So the prices might be much more, much more attractive now, much more affordable, but you have a reason to believe it's going to go up significantly. Whatever you do, and that's, I think, a general point, uh, stay local. And what I mean by that is, um, assuming we're talking about your first real estate transaction, uh, focus yourself and buy in areas that you know, definitely, definitely in the city that you know. Uh, don't be tempted by going into places where you've never been before, you don't know them, um, maybe even in, in, you know, in different countries. Um, it's a whole different topic and I think there's lots of advantages to buying local and lots of disadvantages to buying remote. Um, but to, to really put it shortly and simply, um, don't do it as your first transaction. If you complete the first one successfully, you're feeling more confident and experienced and maybe you want to be a little bit more adventurous, fine. Um, I would strongly recommend against it for the first one. Keep it simple. Um, other parameters, I think it's pretty obvious. Again, based on your budget, based on a little bit of, of small, short market research, um, you will soon realize what size of an apartment you're looking for, how many rooms and so on. Um, if you're completely constrained by the budget, then it doesn't really matter. You buy what you can. If you have a little bit of wiggle room, generally speaking, smaller is better in terms of investment. If it's for your own use, of course, it's up to you. But if we are talking about investment, smaller apartments are better. You will see better returns. Uh, it will be more tradable, even if interest rates go up at a certain point. Um, and it will just be a smaller and easier deal to complete again as your first transaction. Um, in this step and also in the previous one, please note the, the uh, thinking man on the right. Um, I try to indicate what I think should be your state of mind in each of those uh, steps uh, in a very simplified way. Uh, the thinking man, uh, what I'm trying to sh show here is that take your time, think it through and, and really be calm. Don't feel any stress to move forward faster than you feel comfortable. You didn't do anything, you didn't start. So take your time, process it with yourself, what it is that you're looking for uh, based on your budget, based on your preferences, what is generally your plan it doesn't have to be 100% complete, but generally speaking, in general outlines, what is it that you're hoping to achieve? And, and take your time. I'm not saying months and years of, of uh, deliberation, but think about it and, and move forward when you feel ready. Once you do, start searching. Um, actually, it's really easy in our case. Uh, Immobilien Scout 24.de, it's around 80% of the market in Berlin or in, in Germany in general. It's by far the market leader. Um, of course, there are other portals. Um, again, just to keep it simple, if you don't feel like uh, searching on multiple portals, go for this one and stay with this one. It's, it's, it's absolutely fine. It's enough. It's more than enough. It covers most of the market um, and it will be absolutely fine for you. Um, open a user, like open an account, then set your search profile. And here it's important to really um, allow all the email notifications or the app notifications for anything that fits your search profile and um, was just posted. At this point, when we're still in the setup process, again, it's fine. Like we, you didn't start yet. It's all still the preparation and you have all the time in the world. Once you start, once you tell yourself, okay, I have 
I've done my homework, I'm ready to start, and I want to start actually viewing apartments, this is where you need to start getting uh, much faster. And that's here. Based on the search profile that you saved, you will start getting uh, notified of properties that were posted that fit your search profile. Um, it's a very simple uh, process from here on, but you need to do it well because here is where it starts getting competitive and crowded. My uh, personal recommendation to you, um, whenever you get a notification, uh, and it can be a little bit tiring because it's happening a few times a day, um, but whenever you do, immediately check it out. See what it is. If it's a good property, there will be a lot of people competing for it, so make sure you're one of the first ones. And once you do, and if it looks good to you, um, there's two things you can do. You can either reach out through the platform, through Immobilion Scout, uh, immediately to the owner or the uh, agent, the makler that is selling it. In the best case scenario, you can even call them. They would post the telephone number. Um, from my personal experience, um, there's always, in my case at least, there was always the language barrier. I didn't feel that comfortable in the beginning to, to reach out and, and make a phone call in German. Uh, explaining who I am, which property am I talking about, and coordinating uh, a visit. But again, if I go back to what I mentioned before, don't be shy. You simply cannot afford to be shy. Um, with whatever broken German vocabulary you have, um, it's not a German class, it's not a German test. It's, it's a transaction and everybody wants to complete it. So don't be shy. Um, if the makler can switch to a different language that is more comfortable to you, perfect. If not, don't worry still fine. If they haven't posted a, a telephone number, um, you simply send a message via the platform uh, and I strongly suggest you prefer a, a, a template that you have ready in advance. Uh, if you do and you have all the time in the world to prepare it, just do it in German. It will simply increase your, uh, your chances. It doesn't matter if the template is in perfect German and your German is not. It, it really doesn't matter. Just do it. Say a little bit about yourself, what property you're talking about, even though they see it through the platform, and stress that you are ready from your side. You have the documents ready, you have the financing already checked and ready. It will already make you stand out as a more uh, mature uh, potential buyer. At the end, what the, what the maculars care about is what are the chances of this individual completing the deal? Yeah? Um, here's just an example. It's, it's from Immobilien Scout. It, what, it, um, what it looks like, it's a very simple interface. Um, what I put down here is just a little bit of, of um, you know, an opening. I'm interested in this uh, offer and I would like to schedule a meeting um, and to receive further information. Um, I'm adding a little bit of background. It always helps. It, it makes it a little bit more real and it makes the, the makler realize that you put in some time and effort into that and not just, you know, reaching out to a million ads a day. Um, anything that works for you, put it in. Um, if, you are, if you have an EU passport or a German passport, that's great. If not, but you have a, a permanent uh, stay permit, put that in. If you have a, an unlimited uh, war contract with a good salary, that helps you, put it in. These are the things that make you uh, stand out, hopefully, as, as an eligible buyer, as someone who the makler is going to look in and say, okay, I see a good chance of this guy, this girl, completing the deal. Um, and at the end of the day, that's, that's what it's all about. They are getting dozens and hundreds of um, um, requests for every post, and it's just them going through that. That's, that's all it is. Once you've scheduled the meeting, um, it's now time to do a little bit of homework um, so that you come prepared and you make the most out of this viewing. Um, you have to prepare, or it would be very, very beneficial if you do, um, it will simply, simply bring you to this meeting in a much better starting point. Um, look at the area, just on the map, on Google Maps. Um, both like on the normal map and a little bit on the satellite map to see what it looks like. Um, look for anything that might help you understand the area if you don't yet know it. 
Um, and specifically what I mean is you, you see the location, obviously, but you also see the uh, public transport connection. Uh, typically, I used to just run a, a few um, basic searches from the address of this apartment. Um, how long does it take with public transport to Alexanderplatz as, as a central point? How far does it take me to get to the, to the next ring band as a general good connection to the rest of the city? Um, what public transport is available? S-Bahn and tram or maybe only bus, which is not that great. Um, look for parks or open areas that would make the whole uh, neighborhood or the area more attractive to you. Um, at the same time, look for what might be potential problems. If anything looks like a factory or if it looks like a main street that might be very loud. Um, there's a huge difference between um, living in a fodder house, in the front house, uh, facing the street, then maybe living in the, in the inner courtyard where you can hardly hear the street and the address would be the same. So once you know the exact address and you get the details from the macler, just look at the map, see what it looks like. Um, now it doesn't mean that if it seems that it's on the main street, you should just cancel the meeting in advance, but it's, you make a, no, a mental note to look into that and you tell yourself once you go and see the apartment, check that out, check that specific point. If you're buying for an investment uh, and you're looking into areas that are up and coming, maybe not yet um, uh, developed and mature, you can already start looking for signs of that future development happening already now. Um, maybe stuff like how many uh, beer shops are there? If you look at Prenzlauer Berg, it just does a beer shop on every corner. Right? If you look at Marzahn, maybe not so much. So you sort of use that as an indicator of how um, developed the neighborhood is already. Um, you look at cafes and what they look like. And if it's just a, you know, it's a name on Google Maps, then go to Google Street View and look into that, see what it is. If it looks like a business that's been there for the last 50 years, um, or if it looks like something that was opened in the last one or two years, it's a little bit more modern, the neighborhood is getting younger. What it means for you is that it's either turning into a nicer place to live or that the neighborhood is really developing and the prices will probably go up. So in any case, that's a good indication and it's something you can already do from the comfort of your home. Once you finally get to that first viewing, um, if possible, and I strongly recommend it, get there early, especially if it's an area you don't know. And even if it is, uh, take the time, get there early, walk around a little bit, look at the building uh, from the outside, but also at the area in general, the, the street and the, the streets near to that, um, any uh, parks, playgrounds, cafes, whatever, just sort of get a feeling for the area. Um, it's very, very important. If you can, try not to go there alone. Um, if it's a couple going together, it's already easier because while one is doing the talking, the other one can still look around and, and you know you, you switch roles. Um, to go on your own is simply harder. Um, it's hard to, to keep the conversation going with the macler. Um, if German is not your native language and the conversation is in German, it's even harder. Um, it just, I can say for myself that it happened to me more than once or twice that I finished this viewing and then I realized that actually I either had more questions that I didn't get to ask or that I didn't look around enough, I didn't make enough photos and videos that I can go back to and so on. So if you are considering buying a loan, just try to take someone with you. It's, it almost doesn't matter who it is. It's just someone who is a little bit distant from this thing, not so involved and actually it makes them a very good uh, neutral bystander that can help you. As I mentioned before, be shameless. I'm not saying impolite, but shameless. Uh, don't, don't, don't worry about your uh, German grammar or about anything else. Ask as much as you can. This is what the makler is there for. He's or she is there to help you with all of your questions. If they don't know, they need to find out and go back to you uh, with the answers. Um, constantly remind yourself that potentially you're the buyer. You're about to put down a lot of money on that you deserve to get the confidence of getting all your answers uh, from the, from the macro. Um, a few specific points for that first viewing. Um, from the outside, look at the general condition of the building. Um, 
it's both for your own feeling if you're about to leave there, but also again from a financial point of view, if it's not in a good condition, either it's not very nice to live in or you will need to pay in order to make it look nicer. So keep that in mind and, and have a look. Um, look at the inner courtyard at, at where the garbage bins are just as indications of how well the building is maintained. There are very good um, management companies and there are ones that are not that great. Um, there are some cases in Berlin where an owner owns the building but they don't see a very good return on their investment and therefore they really reduce the, the cost as much as they can and the result is just not a pleasant place to live in. So there's nothing specific, it's really your gut feeling. You know what is nice and what is not that nice, just look around, just open your eyes. Inside the apartment, um, even if it's for an investment, uh, it is a lot about the gut feeling. And this goes back to what I said before, um, we're all to a certain extent experienced in this area of real estate because we all lived uh, in, in at least one place, probably more. Uh, we know what is a, a nice apartment to walk into and what maybe is not a, the nicest. If it's only for investment purposes, it's easier. Um, you don't have to fall in love with the apartment. You just need to look at it and say, okay, maybe it's not for me, but I can definitely see a lot of people that would like to live here. Um, if it's for you, of course, it's personal taste and, and so on. But when you walk in, try to just sort of look around, soak it in and, and see if you like it or not. Consider the layout, uh, if it makes sense or not. Um, there's a little, um, like a little side comment about this one. Layouts can be changed. Um, if you really like the apartment, the location, the building, uh, but the layout is not great, you can change it. It's slightly a different story. It means you will have to go into a little bit of renovations and that might put you off. If you don't feel like that and if it's a big no-no, then it's okay. Um, set it aside and move on to the next one. But if you're not too scared of that, try to be creative and think how small changes to the layout can make it a much better place for you to live in. Um, light, uh, always very important, speci specifically here in Berlin. Um, it's not something that can really be changed. So it's, it's as is, just see if you like it or not. If the apartment is really dark, you're probably not gonna like living there and it's gonna be less attractive for potential tenants. And it's just, it is the way it is. Um, noise, if it is facing a street, uh, specifically a big street, um, check it out, open the windows um, and, and see if it's really loud. If it happened to me more than once that I went into an apartment that has beautiful big windows that will never ever be opened because the street is just so loud. Um, don't, don't forget that point because you might end up living there. Um, in general, when looking at the apartment, see if there's anything that you will definitely want to renovate, uh, want to or will simply have to. Uh, now, I'm not talking about small things. Uh, if the walls are not perfectly white, it's not a big deal. Uh, painting the apartment is, you know, it's not going to hurt you financially. Um, however, if you do need to um, replace the floors or polish the wooden floors or whatever, that's already a bigger expense. If you have to basically rebuild the entire electrical system, that's, that's a big expense. And that's also something that takes time. So that's something a little bit more significant. So look into that, ask, when was it last renovated? Um, same goes for the plumbing. These are the, the, the big pits that might end up taking a lot of your money uh, where you didn't plan for it if you didn't check before. So look into that and just ask. If we're looking at an investment and you're buying an apartment that is already rented, ask about the tenant. Um, not everything uh, will be told to you simply because of, of privacy and so on, but it's okay to ask, yeah? Politely and not in, in an intrusive way, but try to understand who lives there, for how long, what's the situation. And of course, if you move forward, you should get the rental contract. At this point, uh, it's time to go home and, and really let it sink in. Think about it. Um, this, this point is a little bit tricky because it's hard to know how fast should you move here. Yeah? You don't want to move forward um, without being confident that it's the right thing for you, but at the same time, you don't want to wait for too long. Um, again, it's a little bit of, of, a, of a gut feeling. You can also ask the macular, what's the situation right now with other interested parties, how much time you have. Um, of course, they will try to push you, but 
try to get a realistic feeling if it's okay to sleep on it for more than one night, uh, talk to some people, get some advice, or, or if you need to sort of keep on moving because otherwise you get out of the game. If your impressions are still positive, if you want to move forward, it is absolutely okay and it's highly recommended to schedule a second viewing. Um, this is super important and it has a few main benefits. First of all, um, you want to validate the impressions you got in the first meeting. Um, once you've had time to digest, once you've had time to discuss it, um, you want to go back and then you will see that it suddenly makes you look at the same property with different eyes. You've already seen it once and now you're seeing a little bit more, you're getting more into the details, it really helps. Plus, if you were interested after the first viewing and now you're going into a second viewing, this can be a very good time to uh, actually bring someone with you that would help you from a professional point of view. It can be um, someone who does appraisals, it can be someone you, you uh, trust that already completed a few deals, um, it can be just uh, whatever, a friend or a relative that you trust their opinion, um, but that's the time. That's, that's the perfect time to do it. Uh, and again, don't, don't be shy here. Uh, I'm not saying bring your whole family there, but ask for this second viewing um, and feel free to come along with, with more people, not just the same people that were there uh, at the first time. Now, specifically, uh, as I mentioned, this is the time to get into the details. Uh, of course, you can always follow up with questions via phone or email, but um, this is time to really see it with your own eyes and look into a few things that might be very meaningful um, if you complete the deal. Specifically, what I'm talking about, on the outside, um, is the roof of the building already built? Um, what I mean by that is that are there already uh, roof apartments? Is the Dachgeschoss already built? In many buildings in Berlin, not yet. If the Dachgeschoss is already built, that's great because it means that the roof itself was also renovated. And then you just want to find out when was it done. Once the roof is renovated, it means that it's good to go for the next 20, 30, maybe even 50 years. So it's one big topic that's off your mind. Um, if not, you have to ask about it if at some point you buy the apartment and a few years later they decide to renovate the roof it's just it's an expense and maybe one that you didn't foresee um, and everybody has to participate so you will have to pay in and um, again not a deal breaker not the end of the world you just want to know before um, from the roof all the way down to the cellar uh, it's just another place where you might run into issues that are potentially expensive if you haven't seen the cellar assuming that there is one if you haven't seen the seller in the first viewing, insist on seeing it in the second one. See the seller that is specifically, uh, that belongs to your apartment, but also walk around in general. Uh, generally speaking, what you're looking for is water in any shape and form. Uh, wetness, dampness, this uh, feeling of, of like really high humidity. Uh, it doesn't need to feel like sitting out on your balcony. Yeah. Uh, and of course, it's a little bit damp. That's, that's what sellers are like in Berlin. But you will see if it's extreme, you will see signs of water damages or anything like that. And uh, same as with anything else, just ask. Has there been any sort of problems in recent years, any sort of repairs? Um, it's very common. It's not always the end of the world, but sometimes it's really expensive. Um, moving to the inside of the apartment, what you're looking to see uh, is any sign of water damage, swollen walls, water stains, those little uh, brown stains that are on the wall or on the ceiling if there was any sort of water damage. Um, again, not the end of the world, it, it happens, but you need to get to the bottom of it. What, what exactly was the issue? Was it already resolved? Uh, how bad was it? And, and so on. As I mentioned before, the floors, um, it's just it's a big expense if you have to replace or, or polish all of them. So take a lot of pictures and videos and, and Try to understand if it's something you're going to live with or you need to uh, put in some money and work. Um, sanitary, basically the shower, the toilet, the sink. Um, it's a little bit of a personal preference, but is it something you're okay with or will you have to replace them? Um, the windows, again, it's a little bit of a topic. Um, if it's being replaced, it's normally being replaced for the whole building. If they are very old, 
might be planned already to do it in the next few years. You just need to have a look and, and ask about it and see where you stand there. Electricity and plumbing, if you haven't asked or looked into it in the first viewing, make sure to do it now. You don't need to be an expert. You need to ask when was it renovated, if at all. It might be still a very old system. And if you're not sure, just take as many pictures and videos as you can. Later, find someone to, to ask or to consult with. Um, but try to get as much information as you can. Um, wallpapers, I think maybe a lot of people don't realize that. It's, of course, it's a matter of prefer uh, preference if you like the wallpapers or not. Uh, if there are wallpapers and you don't like them, that's actually quite expensive. Um, sometimes when you remove them, it's really a mess and, and then you pretty much have to redo all of the walls in the apartment. It's, it's a little bit of time and it's a little bit expensive as well. Um, if you haven't done so yet, ask the Makler about uh, Denkmal shoots or Milier shoots. Um, it's basically two, two forms of regulation in Berlin and it limits what you can and mainly what you cannot do in the apartment. Um, again, not everything here will be a deal breaker and even if the building is under Milier shoots, uh, there's still things that you can do, but if it's a relatively big apartment and you're planning to change out the entire layout, if it's under Milier shoots, officially you're not allowed to, you might not get the permits and you might end up with an apartment with the layout you didn't like and now there's nothing you can do about it. So make sure to find out before. If after those two viewings and after consideration, you're still positive about it and you wanna move forward, the next step would be to make a reservation. Um, Generally speaking, you, if you are able to reserve the apartment, this is exactly the point in time where you can sort of take a breather, relax a little bit and go back to the second state of mind, a little bit more of careful uh, consideration. What a reservation means is that uh, you sign a certain form and you pay a certain amount. It's not a large amount. Typically, this might be between 500 to 1,500 euros. And the point of that is you're basically telling the seller and the makler, hey, I am interested, I'm seriously interested, I'm willing to put down money in order to um, continue the discussion between the seller and myself without the seller being allowed to negotiate with anyone else at the same time. So what you're doing basically is you're securing your, your place at the top of the line. You're the only one who's allowed to negotiate with the seller for a certain period of time. This is exactly the amount of time you need in order to now really finalize your financing based on the concrete apartment you're looking into. It's no longer theoretical, now it's very specific. Uh, and it also gives you time to run any further checks you might wanna have. Um, it is very typical and very likely that you will reach this point where you are generally positive and you're 80% or 90% sure about this, but you still need this little bit extra support. Um, you have a good feeling, everything looks exactly what you hoped for, but it's the first transaction you're not yet certain. And then you just want to bring along a, a, a good after or good after in that would give you a full assessment of the apartment, what it's worth, any potential problems and, and whatever. And this, um, extra professional help will really put your mind at ease and you will be much more comfortable to, to move forward with the deal. That's exactly what the reservation allows you to do. Um, typically, you reserve it for 14 days. You can negotiate that as well. It's not out of this uh, world and you can try to increase that to 21 days by yourself a little bit more time. Um, two important things to mention about that. The money you put down for the reservation is yours. Um, basically, you can still walk away. Nothing has been uh, decided upon, nothing is done. And if you choose to walk away, you deserve to get your money back. It's a very, unfortunately, it's a very common practice to only pay that back partially or not pay it back at all. It, it is absolutely prohibited. It's not okay. It's a little bit unethical in my opinion, but it happens. Um, don't let it scare you in, in the first place and, and don't be afraid to put down that money. If you did 
put down the money. If you pay the reservation fee and now you're deciding not to go ahead with the deal, insist on getting it back. You deserve it. It's your money. You Basically, there's no reason for you to pay it. Um, the second point, if throughout the discussion with the makler until that point, you didn't get the full documentation of the apartment, now is definitely the time and this you need to do as fast as possible. Um, typically, what I listed here is the absolute must. You have to have those documents. Um, Grundbuch Auszug, it's basically the extract from the land register. It shows you um, the, the, the property you're looking into, where is it registered, um, and also any sort of um, loans that are backed by that property and that were entered into the land register, might be from previous owners that still have loans there. Um, it's okay if there is such a loan, it will be probably um, closed and, and, and uh, crossed off as part of the transaction, but you need to know. There shouldn't be anything there that surprises you. Teilungs uh, or basically the plan that shows how the building was divided from just being one big building into many separate and independent apartments. Um, if, and it's I think pretty unlikely, but if at any point you do not get this document, that's a huge red flag. Um, I think it's not very likely, but there have been cases where actually people bought apartments that were not really an individual apartment that is standalone. They actually bought a part of the whole building. Um, okay, um, let's not go into it and spend too much time on it, but just the one thing to remember, the makler should have this available and send it out immediately. If there's any sort of question marks about it, it's a red flag and, and make sure to clarify that. Um, the protocols from the um, um, Eigentümer Versammlung, from the uh, owner's assembly, this is where they make decisions about future plans for the building. What I mentioned, uh, they might decide to um, renovate the roof, uh, to renovate the facade, to do any sort of works in the building that are a considerable expense and that anyone who owns an apartment in that building has to participate in. Um, so you just want to know what has already been discussed, what is being discussed and what has already been decided on. And along the same lines, it will give you a good overview of what has been done in recent years, um, which will also help you. The Jahres it's the, um, the, the final um, calculations of the consumption of the cost of um, water and heating um, and hot water in the building and in the specific apartment. Again, just to help you realize what's, what's going on in that sense, if there's anything here that's out of the ordinary in terms of ongoing costs. Um, in most cases, I wouldn't expect this to be a huge game changer. It's not a huge part of the deal, but if um, for whatever reason, this apartment or this building has a very high costs ongoing. It's something you need to know and, and take into consideration when planning your budget. Lastly, as I mentioned, um, the rental contracting, in case we're talking about a rented apartment. If everything looks good at this point, uh, now is the time to make an offer. Um, generally speaking, it's always negotiable. It might be that the makler told you that it's absolutely not negotiable because there's so much interest and so much demand from the market. Um, generally speaking, you should talk to the makler about it. Um, and in most cases, um, for the makler, it's much more important to have a fast deal than the highest potential price. And so in that case, and I'm saying that cautiously, you can assume that what they're telling you is really uh, uh, true. They're giving you the, the best feedback in order to move forward. Um, theoretically speaking, the makler is working for both parties. Uh, he's also uh, serving you. I'm saying theoretically, because at the end of the day, most of the communication is with the seller and not with you. Um, however, some of them, and uh, it's, it's worth mentioning, some of them are good and honest people. It happened to me before that I made an offer for a certain price and the makler actually got back to me with even a lower one. I was very surprised, but he explained to me that he's just trying to get the best deal uh, for everybody. Um, 
he started off with a slightly lower price than what I offered just to have some wiggle room and the owner actually said yes. Um, so always be cautious, but don't always assume that they are trying to uh, cheat you or trying to sell you the apartment no matter what. Um, and definitely consult with them when it comes to negotiating. Assuming that you're going to negotiate and you're going to try to take the price down, um, still be respectful. If you're uh, sending out an email to the seller or via the macler to the seller and you're uh, uh, offering a price that is lower, first of all, of course, be respectful. Don't try to reduce uh, 30%. It's, it's just, it's disrespectful and no one's gonna take that. Um, and if you're reducing any amount, just try to put that together with an explanation. You notice that the bathroom is a little bit old and you're gonna need to, to renovate. Uh, you will need to put in some work into the electricity or, or whatever. Um, it just makes it much nicer. It gives the seller a better feeling that you are interested, you're serious, and you have very good reasons for why you want to take the price down and not just purely for uh, negotiating a better price for yourself. At this point, uh, it's worth mentioning, if you're not aware, if you don't, net, you don't yet know, sorry, um, this is what the total deal costs are. Um, on top of the purchase price, which you will negotiate now. You will normally have to add the macular fee. Um, please note that starting from this year, um, the macular fee is 3.57% uh, including VAT, it changed. It used to be double that. Um, some new regulations came into force and now the macular fee should be split evenly between buyer and seller. It means that this is the maximum macular fee that you should pay. Um, in terms of how the market really works, it's very likely that the seller, knowing that they're gonna to need to pay that, will simply increase the sell price by a little bit. Nothing you can do about that, um, but just make sure that this is really the market, the macular fee that you agree on, and uh, you shouldn't pay more than that. Notary costs are not uh, entirely fixed. It depends on the amount of financing that you take, but generally speaking, calculate uh, more or less one and a half, uh, yeah, one and a half percent. Uh, and taxes, relatively high in Germany, 6% uh, for the uh, transfer of the property from the seller to you. Once you have those numbers uh, and you have the price you want to offer, this should give you the total deal costs. Surprisingly, from here on, actually, it's quite simple. Um, when talking about the buying contracts, uh, the purchase contracts, um, they are pretty standard in most cases. Um, again, you shouldn't take it too lightly and it's a big transaction and you need to understand what's going on. Um, but there is something nice about the German real estate market for, for, um, for private investors or private owners. Um, the, the notary is supposedly neutral. It's, uh, it's the notary's um, job and liability to make sure that you are really uh, signing a deal for an apartment that's really there, that the owner is really allowed to sell, that is properly entered into the land register and so on. Um, the, the contracts are very standard. They are very similar to one another. If, however, this is your first transaction and assuming the contract by default is in German, you need to understand what's going on. There. Um, it's not easy language, even for native speakers. It's, it's not really German. It's more, legalese, um, use whatever way you feel comfortable with. If you're okay with German, great. If you need to translate it, also okay. If you're still not comfortable with that, then get some help, but make sure you understand what's going on. Uh, not each and every word and sentence, but you have to understand what each uh, section is talking about, what it means, and, and, and what's in the contract you're about to sign. Um, you need to have a certain basic level of, of German. Um, the notary will check that they have to, they're obliged to. It's not a German test. It's, it's very, very easy. They all want to complete the deal, uh, but they need to make sure that you understand what you're signing. That's part of their uh, liability. Uh, if you don't speak any German at all, you need to let them know in advance. Some of them will draft a contract in English for you uh, or bilingual. Uh, in other cases, you will just have to get a translator. It's a little bit of an extra cost, but it's not, not the end of the world. One important note, because I know it's pretty popular. 
if you are planning to buy an apartment that is being built, the apartment is not yet there, it's a project that is now uh, in the works. It's a contract that's called Emma Befau. In that case, and I strongly urge you to do that, get help. Um, it's, uh, it's happening, it's unfortunately pretty common that those contracts are not, uh, not really pro-buyer. There's a lot of things that can go wrong with, with a project like that. It can take longer to complete. They're not going to be on schedule. Um, the contract itself is more complicated uh, because there's a lot of what ifs in case of delays, in case of permits that uh, they do not get on time and so on. Um, you need to be protected. And without getting into too much details on that specific topic, I strongly urge you get help. Pay for the extra help, it's worth it. The notarization itself, uh, I have to say it's a little bit of an anticlimax. Um, after this long uh, road that you took, uh, going through all the steps, all the different checks and, and everything, once you get to the, to the notarization, um, unfortunately the notary will simply have to read out the entire purchase contract word by word. That's what they do. Um, it's very, very boring. Um, it's not so much you can do, you just have to sit in, it takes a while. Uh, there will be a little bit of, of uh, questions to you, especially around the topic of really understanding the language. At the end, uh, you sign it, and then, and only then, the deal is done. And that's a very important point. Um, we're almost at the end of the process, we're almost at the end of the talk. Uh, by now, you might have a feeling of the process and what it looks like, everything that you need to check uh, and so on, it's really, really important to say, even during the notarization meeting, and unfortunately it happened to me, even during the notarization, you can walk away until the notary finished reading the purchase contract and everybody signed, the deal is not done. If for whatever reason you have to, I'm, I'm sure it's not pleasant, but walk away. Um, the only reason I'm saying that is that it should give, you, should give you a certain level of confidence that whatever happens up until that point, you're not yet committed. You're not in the deal yet. Uh, nothing has been done. I hope that it doesn't happen. I hope that whatever you need to look into, you did it before. But if, in whatever extreme case, then just be aware, it's okay. Not the nicest, but it's okay. Then, however, once it's done, that's it, the deal is done. Um, from here on, it's even more of an anticlimax because uh, surprisingly, once the contract has been signed, nothing happens. Basically go home, uh, you expect to be very excited, but there's not so much going on. Uh, from here on, it's, it takes a few weeks, up to a few months, depends. Um, it's a little bit of a, of a process here. You will start getting basically uh, lots of letters and you will start getting requests to pay. Um, the, the fastest ones always will be the maklers. Uh, you might get a, a mail from them with the invoice on the day of notarization uh, to pay their fee. Um, from there on, you will have to pay the different fees to the notary, the, um, the Grundverbsteuer, the taxes. And at some point, uh, you will get a notice that everything has been completed and the ownership has been transferred to you. And that's it. The deal is done and then you can celebrate. I want to try and zoom out from all of those details and really sum it all up before we move on to a little bit of questions as much as time will allow. Um, it's a long-term investment and you need to keep that in mind. Um, I think in general, but specifically in Germany, because of the, the costs that are related, uh, there's not so much potential for individual investors to uh, perform any sort of short-term deal. It's a long-term investment, it's a long-term effort. It, the good thing is that it's, if done right, it can be almost on autopilot. It's a very um, low maintenance effort. And after a few years, you might end up being very, very happy with the investment you've made. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's a very simple business concept. You buy a property and you either move in there or you rent it out. Um, there's nothing complicated about it. In that sense, even if things go wrong, it's not because it's super complicated, it's really simple. 
it's long term, as we mentioned, and it's also large scale. Um, in most cases, mainly uh, due to the financing. So you're using leverage, but you're making a deal that is probably bigger than any deal you ever made before. Um, in the right places in this process, especially in the preparation part, take the time. Don't let anyone external stress you or push you forward when you're not ready. Uh, consider what it is you're hoping to get from that. Consider what would be the best deal for you. Um, if you're not sure, don't get stuck in those dilemmas, just try. If you're not sure about deciding whether you want to buy for your own use or for investment, start with either one um, set up accordingly and then just start going forward and see what it, where it gets you. Um, it's better to stay in motion, it's better to move forward in a certain direction and then to correct your course than just sit at home and, and get stuck in those endless dilemmas. The last thing I want to say, and I think it's maybe the most meaningful one, uh, and it's just very typical for real estate investments. Uh, if it looks a little bit out there, if it looks a little bit far away from you, a little bit complicated, if the long-term thing sort of um, um, pushes you away from it, think about how you feel about all those people around you that you know that own real estate, that tell you that they bought it just a few years ago and the prices have gone up by so much since then. Um, what we're talking about is your opportunity to be one of those people within a few years. That in five years or 10 years from now, some of your friends will be talking about you and saying, what a great deal have you made? Why haven't I done the same? And so basically uh, you're joining into the game and in that sense, and that sense only, it's better sooner than later. Uh, the sooner you get into the game, the better it is uh, the more experience you will gain, and yeah, you should. In whatever time we have left, are there any questions? Thank you very much. So there are plenty of questions. There's a lot of questions. Um, please tell us how much time do you have, uh, depending on your plans for the day. Um, but meanwhile, I can start already reading out the questions if that's okay with you. Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. Just, just uh, the thing we said we will have this talk today until eight uh, thirty or forty-five. Now it's eight twenty-five. So stop me at your convenience, or we can go through the next fifteen or so questions. Uh, just uh, really quick, like one minute a question or so. I'll do my best. Okay. Is there a tool to see what is the new value of an apartment a year after you bought that? Or how can you calculate the real value increase? Yes. The first thing and simplest you can do, it's not very scientific, but simply uh, on the same platform on Immobilien Scout, simply search for similar apartments to the one that you bought. On top of that, I would add, and I would uh, write it now in the chat, um, there's a few really, really cool tools that you can use. Um, the first one would be, I'm oh, sorry, homeday.de. Um, just go uh, on homeday.de uh, or search on Google for homeday.de or just put it here, homeday price atlas. And similarly, emo and scout price atlas um, both of them are pretty handy pretty easy to use on home day you can really just wander around in the city you can click on like a specific block uh, they have more information for some areas and less for others that's fine that's just the way it is but it's a really cool tool and really helps you get a feeling for price development and for everybody who's watching this recording and cannot see the chat conversation, just Google Home Day Price Atlas or Immobilien Scout 24 Price Atlas. Next question is, what would your advice be to non-Germans who are still on the path to learning the language to the level of fluency? Are there any real estate firms that provide their services in English? Do you have any specific suggestions? Um, 
if I'm if I'm sort of going through the process as as it was laid out here, um, in terms of, of the first financial checks, um, a lot of the financial um, like the mortgage brokers will speak English uh, because obviously a lot of internationals were buying in Berlin in in recent years. Um, the one that I mentioned in the presentation, HippoFriend, um, I think by default it sets the language to English or the language of your browser or whatever. It's very international uh, by design, so feel free to start there. In terms of mortgage brokers, um, like I said, a lot of them will, will speak English. If they don't, move on. It's fine. There's plenty of them, uh, and if you have to go through one or two that wouldn't speak English to you and then end up with the one that would, then, then that's fine. Do banks give now a hundred percent mortgage in Germany? They might, yes. Uh, basically, <laughs> there's a there's sort of a, of a hierarchy here. <clears throat> sorry, of what? Excuse me. <clears throat> what the uh, typical German bank would consider to be uh, the best type of of, uh, of a loan taker. The absolute perfect scenario for them would be a couple married um, both of them with german passports uh, both of them employed in unlimited contracts preferably of course with a good income and in a big well-known german company that is the absolute dream of of any financial institute that offers loans uh, in germany um, however it doesn't mean that you uh, won't get a loan if you're not exactly that um, as long as you have a permanent work contract, unlimited, uh, and a permanent uh, stay permit, any sort of, of uh, visa, residency, anything like that, it's a pretty good starting position. Um, generally speaking, uh, now with everything that's happening around Corona and the market, you know, behaving a little bit different than, let's say, a year ago, uh, the, the general the, uh, assumption is that the interest rates are very, very low. So if you get a loan, it can be very, very, very attractive. Um, the banks might look into you a little bit more deeply than they have before. They are a little bit more cautious. Again, uh, just, just trying to hedge themselves against the, the extra risks that the corona crisis brings with it. Next question is on a similar topic. What would you say is the minimum initial capital? Can be in percents, for example. Um, yeah, it's a really good question. It really depends. Um, if if I, 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 you know, I connect that to the previous question and answer, if you are potentially a very good uh, loan taker uh, in terms of your uh, employment, how much you actually make and so on, but you don't have a lot of capital, um, you can still be fine. If you were able to save up a lot, but currently your income is not very stable, that might be a little bit more tricky. So it's really individual and sometimes it's a little bit hard to say. It's, it's really a combination of all of those factors together. However, um, again, like I said, if, if, if you're unsure, uh, just reach out and see, see what, what feedback you get. Sort out your own uh, own capital, how much you can really bring uh, to the deal uh, from your own money and then keep going from there. It's also a question of, of you know, your plans and what you're, you're hoping to do. Um, generally speaking, it is possible to get more than 100% financing, but I'm not, I'm not sure that that's really, from my point of view at least, that that would be my recommendation for anyone. Uh, at the end, like I said, it's, I'm, I'm all for it. I think that finance, financing a deal is, is, uh, is necessary, uh, but at the end, it's also a loan that you have to pay back. So, you know, you need to balance it. Um, it is very, very individual. And in, in if whoever asked it has an individual case, then I suggest we take it offline and they can just reach out for me. I'll uh, put my email in the chat uh, later so anyone can just feel free to reach out. Okay, so we have 50. Sorry, we have 15 more questions, uh, a few more were added. 
would be interesting to know how much brokerage or consultancy fee are charged on average with that minimum initial capital and round about what the monthly mortgage payments end up being as well. Oh. Uh, um, what the mortgage payments are, it really depends on, on you know, the amount that you're taking, the amount of uh, financing you need for the deal, and uh, that's very, very individual. However, there's tons of mortgage calculators um, out there. In that specific case, to get a general idea, it doesn't matter if you uh, go on a mortgage calculator that's for the uh, US market, the general mechanism is the same. What you should remember uh, in this case, if you're trying to estimate what the payments are going to look like, uh, typically, the bank wouldn't want you to start with um, an initial uh, payment rate or Tilgung in German of less than 2%. Um, it's just, it doesn't make much sense. It, it, it's, a, it's a high risk for them. Um, and you have to add on top the, the interest rate. Um, it can vary a lot, so it's really hard to give one answer, but very generally speaking, uh, you can start running your own scenarios by estimating roughly uh, what, what amount of financing you're going to need. Put it in one of the calculators where you assume a 2% uh, payment rate and a certain interest. Again, today, you might get an amazingly low interest, but just to be on the safe side, be a little bit more conservative. Uh, anything between 0.8% to 1% interest rate uh, is probably realistic uh, if you're a good uh, buyer right now. It's a rough estimate, so don't, don't take it as a fixed number, uh, but you can use that as a starting point. There was a first part of the question, which I'm, I'm not sure I got, something about the brokerage fees. Yeah, but I believe that you did cover that later, so I think that's fine. Uh, you showed the slide about that after the question came. So I'm uh, moving on to the next question. If I get a mortgage and I have to pay, for example, a thousand euros a month, can I pay more than that when I can to make the mortgage end earlier? Yes, you can. It's a very good question. Um, again, financing is, is, is a topic on its own, and we can spend hours talking about that. But the short answer to this question is yes, definitely. In most or in all uh, mortgage uh, contracts, there's a range uh, which shows how low can the monthly payments be and also how high can they be. Uh, there's a top limit because the bank wouldn't want you to take a loan for 10 years and pay it back within two years. It's just, it's not what they plan for and it's less profitable for them. Uh, generally speaking, it would be between 2% to 8%, in some cases even 10%. Um, that you can pay out of the principal of the loan on an annual basis, plus uh, the bank has to offer you what is called a Sondertilgung, which means a, a one-time payment that you can do once a year uh, up to a certain amount. It can be any amount, it can be 50 euros, just to sort of uh, take one more step forward, uh, but it can also be quite considerable, it can be a few thousands. Next question. What is a good benchmark for prices? How do I measure whether a property is cheaper or more expensive for a particular neighborhood? So it goes back to Home Day and uh, Emo Scout Price Atlas. You can definitely use those. On Emo Scout, when you look at a certain property, in most cases, uh, if you go into the listing and you go all the way down, they would show you a scale of the prices. Um, what they try to do is really, is exactly that, is to show you if that property is expensive or not. To be absolutely fair, it's not exact science. Yeah? Um, the, one of the downsides of the real estate market is that it's not that transparent. It's actually quite opaque. No one has the full information except for the finance. Um, but Home Day and Emoscout definitely try, and it's a, it's a very good starting point. What kind of questions are good to ask the Maklo? This is in the context of viewing an apartment. Um, well, everything I mentioned in the presentation, and uh, like I said, it's, um, 
I, I, I wanted to put this together as sort of a checklist you can always go back to, and I strongly encourage you to do so. It's even more true because you will see it in, you know, in, in, in the real life scenario, you will see that actually the viewing, um, it sort of goes by really fast and you might end up you know, walking out and saying, uh, actually I had a few more questions or I didn't ask about this or about that. So the key topics is what I already mentioned in the, um, in the presentation. Uh, I will maybe say again, what you need to cover, because you cannot cover everything. You know, there's always uh, some extreme scenario that you might not be aware of, but what you should cover is the things that might end up costing you a significant amount of money. Um, there's a lot of smaller things and, and it's not that bad, but the big things are really, if there's anything big planned in the building in terms of renovation, they're building up the facade, um, they're planning to renovate the roof, anything like that. Or there's a huge issue in the cellar and now everybody, everybody has to participate in, in fixing it. Yeah? If those things happen, there's no choice. Um, you have to pay your proportional part uh, and it might end up being a few thousands of euros or even more. Um, so that's one thing. When you get the documents from the makler, you will also be able to see what amount is currently saved up um, in the building's account which is planned exactly for those things. Now, if the building is managed well, there will be a considerable amount of money there. And then even if there's any sort of surprises, there's already amount that's set aside for it. Uh, if you see that, the, um, that actually there's no money there, it's not a deal breaker. It's a little bit of, of a warning sign. It's not a big red flag, but it is a red flag. And you should look into that. You should try to understand what's going on there. Uh, how come it's, it's the way it is? Maybe they spend all of that money on whatever. Um, and at least, you know, it's a story you can understand and you can live with. Um, but you need to look into that. Uh, other than that, it's really more the commercial topics, um, you know, in terms of the, uh, the owner, how flexible they are, if there's a little bit of um, what the Germans like to call Spielraum. Yeah, is the price a little bit flexible? It will give you a good feeling of how, how to move forward in terms of the um, negotiation. I'd like to hear, <clears throat> oh, sorry. Uh, do you recommend buying a pre-built apartment? Um, no, I recommend buying uh, whatever apartment is right for you, for your needs and for your budget and whatever deal you're going ahead with, do it properly. Uh, if it's not yet built and if it's being built right now, what I mentioned, the, the Emma Befau scenario, get help. Um, it's, it's more complex. It's, what you have to understand is that in a simple transaction where the apartment is already there and you're buying, it's pretty easy. I mean, the apartment is there, you know what you're buying. Yeah? Um, if it's not yet built, there's just uh, so many other things that could go wrong. And in most cases, it's around schedule. Just consider this if you're planning to move into an apartment in January uh, 2022. Yeah? And accordingly, you terminate your rental contract, you make your financial plans, but comes January, there's nothing, and it takes another year until it's ready, you need a place to live, you need to keep on paying rent, you have the mortgage already lined up and it's, and it's waiting, and you might end up paying fees for that. Um, and of course, a lot of your money is already in that apartment that is not yet built. What happens then? That may, uh, might end up being very, very expensive and complex and, and mentally it's just, it's no fun at all. A, a good contract will protect you from that and then you take a risk, but it's a reasonable one. Uh, but unfortunately, there are not so good contracts out there with companies that do not respect the clients in, in that manner. Uh, and that may, might be a little bit complicated. So specifically in that case, uh, don't, don't take it for granted that the contract is okay and really get help. Um, can you share some pros and cons of working with the real estate agents on the buyer side? I guess you covered that pretty much, but if you want to give one sentence about that. Um, yes, uh, look, I, I think probably the easiest is to give an example uh, from my own experience. In the first apartment that I bought together with my partner, um, we paid for um, consulting from the buyer side, from our side. 
because we needed that extra level of confidence that what we're doing makes sense, that we can minimize the risk. There's always a little bit of risk because otherwise, you know, you shouldn't do anything, but we knew that we, we were minimizing the risk to a, to a very reasonable level. And in, you know, in the big picture, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, when you put it into the Excel sheet and we bought it as an investment, that extra cost of consulting didn't, didn't shift the, the yield, you know, to, from being great to being not attractive, not at all. It, it was a little bit of an extra cost, but I think it was worth it. To be absolutely honest, um, I think back in the day, if we wouldn't have gotten this external help, it would have taken us much longer. It also helped us to commit already from day one and, and push ourselves in the right direction. Does the meet and decal law affect real estate prices in Berlin currently? Yeah, uh, it does and it doesn't. Um, we could stay here probably for another hour or two and discuss meet and decal. And the hardest thing about it is not that it's complex, it's that it's really, uh, I might be biased, sorry, but it's just, it's not well formulated from a legal perspective and it leaves a lot of sort of question marks and black holes. So it's really hard to talk about it in, in absolute terms. What is, what is allowed, what is not allowed, what exactly is the effect and, and how, how does the market react? Having said all that, uh, if we simplify, there's two types of buyers, as we just said, those investors and those uh, buyers for, for private use. Um, from the moment the meet and decal was introduced and later officially came into force, you can definitely see that the market has slowed down in terms of the investors' activity. But at the same time, good apartments did not go down in prices because the private buyers are still there and the demand is still very, very strong. Um, and if you consider uh, 2020 or even 2021 already, it's pretty much a, a perfect storm. It's the meet and decal, which is very, very extreme in terms of price regulation. And then you combine it with Corona and I mean, it's a mess. And still prices haven't gone down for the more attractive apartments for own use. Um, where you could see prices going down, is especially with apartments that were owned by investors. Uh, they never planned to move in because maybe they weren't that great to begin with. Um, they have a long-term tenant that's paying a ridiculously low amount of rent and they were counting on this tenant to someday move out and then they would increase the rent, maybe renovate or, or whatever. This plan is currently, I wouldn't say irrelevant, but it's, it's higher risk because there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, last thing about the meeting, decal, bear in mind, it's still being discussed by the Supreme Court, by the uh, Bundesverfassungsgericht in Karlsruhe. They were supposed to give the verdict already. They haven't done so. They delayed it to second quarter of 2021. So hopefully if they don't delay again, theoretically by the end of June, there's a little bit of clarity in the market. Um, it's hard to say anything definite about it right now. So we have reached the end of time, but we have nine more questions. So I can propose two action, uh, two types of action moving forward. Either we call this a day or we do a quick ping pong of a question answer and a little bit of a faster pace. Uh, how does the time constraint look on your side? Um, I will add a third item. I will just put my email now in the chat. So anyone who's online um, can reach out later if they haven't done so, feel free to reach out. Um, you can also add the email later to the meetup uh, uh, event yeah. and then anybody who goes back to the meetup event, uh, it's always there. Yeah. So if you're uh, watching this on, on like the recording, uh, then my email would be in the meetup event. Um, other than that, yeah, let's, let's try to cover as much as we can. So shoot. All right. What is the usual reasonable percent to lower the offer for the negotiation? Um, Nice question. It's how to give a definite answer, but I think 5-10% is very reasonable. Um, and then maybe in individual question uh, cases even more. Will there always be a makler or do some properties uh, owners, uh, property owner handle the process themselves? <laughs> um, there are some apartments offered by the owner itself, yeah. Um, 
But if you filter your search to only buying from these people, it's gonna be hard. What you will come across is uh, deals that have supposedly no macular fee. Uh, you can be 100% sure that in this case, the seller pays all of the macular fee, which means that it's simply inside the purchase price. So you're paying for it either way. However, if it's inside the purchase price, it's easier to have it financed by the bank. So it's a little bit of an advantage. Is it possible to get a loan if one does not have a permanent residence and no EU citizenship? And how long do you think these low interest rates will stay? Um, uh, it's hard to say. If you're not a permanent resident, uh, it's definitely harder. It might be that simply you will get a loan, but the conditions won't be as attractive. Doesn't mean you shouldn't take it. You should put it in an Excel sheet and see if it works for you, but it won't be the best conditions that are out there. And you might have to provide other securities. So the bank might say, okay, uh, we will give you a loan if someone else can, uh, uh, can also be uh, liable for that loan or they will force you to open a bout power for tag, which is a very horrible thing, but it's still, it's there. Uh, I can explain it offline if anyone is interested. Um, so I, I wouldn't say no, but it's gonna be harder. Uh, in terms of low interest rates, wow, uh, that's, uh, how should I say, that's above my pay grade. Uh, no one knows. Okay, if buying for investment, would you recommend renting through a house for Valtung or by yourself? Uh, sorry again, what was the second part? If you buy an apartment for investment, would you recommend renting it through a house for Valtung or by yourself? Ah, no, by yourself, do it by yourself. Do it by yourself, save the fees that they take. Um, if it's the house of Altum that's managing the apartment, um, unless they are extremely good, they're simply, they don't do a good job. I'm sorry, it's just the way it is. Um, if it's any of the platforms, whatever, the Wunder Flats of the world, the fee that they take really eats into your margins. Plus, it's my personal opinion, at least in the beginning, do it yourself. Uh, go through the process, the bureaucracy, whatever, see in person the people that you are uh, renting your apartment to. If after a year or two you're saying, actually, I don't like it at all, it's taking away my free time and I don't want it and you want to outsource it, fine, do it. But uh, I am a very big fan of learning by doing, at least in the first step. Next question is, can we have your details? So you posted this to the chat and it will be on the meetup event, which is linked from the YouTube. So the next one is, would you recommend purchasing a new house or an old house? Um, again, a little bit of personal preferences. Really briefly, Altbaus have, you know, the, 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 the charm of, of an Altbau. Uh, and, and, and I am a fan. Uh, the newer buildings obviously have much higher uh, building standards in terms of uh, sustainability, uh, energy consumption, and so on. Some of them, in my opinion, are a little bit uh, lifeless or soulless, uh, but it's a matter of personal taste. Are you also specialized in buying real estate outside of Germany? No. Why buy an apartment for self-use when rental laws in Germany are extremely pro-tenant? Um, it's a good question. <laughs> like I said, I'm a fan of buying for an investment, um, but it, it, for some people it's just a matter of prefer uh, like personal preferences. It's, it's maybe the mental thing of owning the place you live in. Um, but I agree, I mean, the, the rental laws in Germany are so much pro-tenant that if you find a nice apartment for a reasonable price, you can pretty much stay there forever. Uh, and and I, I would definitely take advantage of that. Would you be optimistic about returns on your investment in Berlin when you buy your apartment now? Yes, very much so. Uh, again, it's a, it's a topic for a different presentation, but to put it shortly, the, in my opinion, the, the, what drives the prices in Berlin up even now with Mittendeckel, with Corona, uh, is, is a few very strong factors that are still there. Um, Berlin is still behind compared to other cities in Germany, compared to other cities in Western Europe. Um, I'll put it like this, it's the capital city of the biggest and strongest economy in Europe, and it's still one of the cheapest cities in Western Europe. 
doesn't make much sense. Uh, so the prices will keep on going up, in my opinion. Yeah, it's, of course, it's, I don't know that for sure. The fourth strongest economy in the world. Any yeah. quick tips about buying from auctions directly from the bank? Uh, yes, it's, it's super interesting, um, but it's a little bit of a roller coaster. Um, it sounds like a, a whole talk on its own. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you it, can see like all well, the thoughts running through your head. It is very much so. Uh, whoever asked it, let's take it offline. I'm, I'm happy to answer. Uh, it can be very interesting financially. It can be even a little bit of, of fun. It's exciting, uh, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a little bit different. Would you recommend purchasing an office building as an investment? Uh, no. <laughs> now in, in Corona, I'm, I'm really not sure what's going to happen in the uh, commercial real estate sector. Um, it's a really risky investment. It can be very, very attractive if you believe that everything will go back to normal. Um, I'll put it like this. I had a meeting in the Volkswagen a few days ago and uh, they told me that they are building a new building that is designed in the first place for 60% of their workforce. Uh, actually, regardless of Corona, they planned it a few years ago. So it's really hard to say. Uh, um, it seems like there's more than one reason for the demand for office space to go down. Uh, from that on, it's a much more complex uh, plan. I mean, maybe you think that you can buy an office building and then turn it into apartments, and that can be an amazing deal, but it's a little bit more complex. It's long term, obviously, if you buy a building, the investment is quite big. So, um, yeah, that, that's, that's a different story. Do you recommend building a house or buying a fertig house in Berlin? Well, well where can you build a house in Berlin? Uh, again, here, I mean, if I have to give a very short answer, buy, buy a house and then if you need, just renovate and, and adjust it to your needs. Um, building a house is something else. It's, it's, it's a process you go through that is, you know, it takes a while and at the end of the day, you either pay someone a lot of money or you end up being the project manager. Um, and, and there, if you go through that, again, you might learn a lot. You might even enjoy it if you like it, but you will experience every sort of complexity uh, that is in this uh, area and it's not necessarily for everybody so but then you're welcome to come and give a talk about that oh definitely. <laughs> i think last question that we have is uh, is as part of what you do do you have a service of assisting buying a flat i do yes uh, if you're interest, interested just reach out via email and we can talk about the details Right, last, last question, <laughs> and I'm for real, I'm putting two dots in the chat. Um, is it still lucrative to buy in Brandenburg? I think so, yes, yes. Super, then uh, we have come to an end. Thank you very much for sharing from your experience in uh, all the work you're doing around uh, buying and helping other people to buy. Uh, yeah, Thank your email you. is there because I'm sure so many people have so many more questions. So yeah, uh, reach out to Hagai and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Natalie, for putting it together. Bye. Have a good night. Have a good night.